Bot Slab, correct? And then he's going to be talking to us today about uh, some published work that came out this year, if I'm not mistaken, on uh, lightning damage and how it facilitates beetle colonization in the tropics. Go ahead and let Brady take it away. And Thanks, Brady, could I, could I record your uh, presentation, Brady? Sure. Okay, thank you. All right, and do I have permission to uh, share my screen? Yes, I believe you do, sir. Okay. Yes, and I'm going to mute all microphones except for Brady's, hopefully. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. All right, cool. All right, so for those of you who I haven't got a chance to uh, speak with yet, my name is Brady Parlato. As uh, Ted said, I'm a first year uh, grad student in uh, the bio department here at EKU. Um, and today I'm gonna to be giving you a uh, presentation, a bio seminar presentation on uh, this project that was recently published um, called Lightning Facilitates Beetle Colonization of Tropical Trees. And uh, my co-authors on this project uh, were uh, Dr. Steve Inobiak, he's here today with us, uh, shown there in the middle. Uh, he's a professor of biology at the University of Louisville. And on the right there is Dr. Evan Gora, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. So I could not have done this project without them. Uh, thank you to you both. So getting into first a little bit of fun stuff. Well, it's all fun, but it's particularly fun stuff. Um, just a quick shameless photo barrage, as I call it. Um, just a quick, a few uh, interesting photos I took while in Panama. Um, on the left there, that is a uh, cane toad, uh, Renella marina, if I'm saying the scientific name right. Um, they are native to uh, mainland Central and uh, South America, uh, so native to Panama, uh, but they are invasive to uh, parts of Australia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, in the center there, that is a green and black poison dart frog, uh, Dendrobates aratus, that's one of my favorites. And on the right there is a, a litter frog. I'm not sure in the scientific name, but uh, what I just heard them call was leaf litter frogs or litter frogs. On the top there, you can see they have a very unique form of a camouflage there. Uh, they sort of look like dead or decaying leaves uh, from above. So pretty cool kind of camouflage there. And just a few more, just three more, uh, some arthropods for some entomologists. Um, so on the left there, that is a particularly cool caterpillar. Um, the common name from what I understand is the birthday cake caterpillar because it has sort of a, a colorful body and then the sort of uh, birthday cake candle kind of hairs from at the top. Um, in the middle there, that is a tarantula, I'm not sure I'm the species, but it was a pretty large one it lived inside of this railing here. There was an opening on the railing that it, that it crawled into and it, it lived inside of there. And on the right there um, are a couple of uh, peanut head bugs, which are definitely the weirdest things I've ever come across. Uh, I was very, very shocked. I thought I found a couple aliens when I first saw those. Um, but some very interesting uh, bugs there. So now getting into uh, the background of this particular study. So uh, this study was part of a uh, summer REU experience that I did uh, in the summer of uh, 2019. Uh, it was funded by the uh, Science Honors Program at my undergraduate institution, uh, Georgetown College. And all the research took place here on uh, Barrow, Colorado Island uh, in Panama. Um, and one of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute's uh, field stations is located here on this island, as you can see. So getting into the introduction. So what a lot of people don't firmly grasp is that lightning is a, is a very important natural disturbance agent in forests worldwide. Um, and most of our research on lightning as a natural disturbance agent has come from studies in temperate forests, um, particularly uh, from pine forests in the Southeastern United States. So around our general area. Um, so, these studies have generally found a few, few broad things. For one, uh, lightning in temperate forests has been found to ignite fires. It's a major source of fires. Um, and as well, it provides, uh, in turn, because of these fires, it's a major source of uh, dead wood. And this dead wood provides food and habitat for a myriad of species, uh, different taxonomic groups. Um, but what I'm going to focus on here is uh, bark beetles and wood boring beetles. So what do we specifically know about this lightning beetle association from these temperate forest studies? Uh, well, for one, lightning has been found to leave large wounds, as you might expect, in struck trees, which are particularly attractive to beetle invaders. Um, two, uh, lightning strikes have been found to weaken uh, tree defensive mechanisms, such as uh, in resin production, uh, shown there in the bottom left, it's keeping a couple of beetles out. Uh, lighting has been found to weaken those kind of defensive mechanisms. And uh, lastly, 
uh, kind of you would expect, but uh, these, these beetles have been found to finish off large tracts of trees in temperate forests that were otherwise just damaged by lightning. They weren't killed by the lightning and the beetles come and finish them off. Um, and one of the major culprits of this is the Asian longhorn beetle uh, shown there on the right there. So what about this lightning beetle relationship in tropical forests? Um, so this relationship has really not been studied that much in these tropical forests, uh, particularly, well, I think the reason is uh, in temperate forests, usually lightning damage to a tree is very conspicuous uh, versus in tropical forests, you really don't have this same sort of conspicuous damage on, on the trees. So it's harder just to even uh, determine which trees were damaged uh, in tropical forests. So a possible reason why this relationship has not been investigated much, as much in the tropics compared to temperate forests. Um, so why is this even important? Why would we even bother investigating this in tropical forests? Um, so again, coming back to that dead wood, uh, lighting again is a major producer of dead wood and the abundance and diversity of dead wood is in turn, you would expect uh, to influence the abundance and diversity of insect and decomposer communities. Um, in particular here, uh, saproxylic beetle communities. So the term saproxylic here just means that these beetles are going to be relying heavily on dead and decaying wood uh, for food and habitat. Um, so we would expect if we found a relationship between lightning frequency or lightning strikes and uh, beetle community diversity uh, in these tropical forests, uh, we would expect that uh, with a greater frequency of lightning strikes, which I'll talk more about at the end, um, but with a greater frequency of lightning strikes, we would expect a uh, greater abundance and diversity of these saproxylic beetles and then cascading effects on other taxonomic groups. Um, but I'll get into more about that uh, later in the discussion. And there are just a couple of uh, quick photos. On the left there, that is a beetle, not shown on the species, but that was taken on a tree in a, on a healthy tree. It was not a lightning struck or damaged tree. And on the right there, either a couple of beetles are mating or fighting, not sure which, um, but on a fallen tree in a lightning strike uh, site, just to give you a sense of the different sort of beetles you'd find, what the different trees look like there. So then getting into the specific objective and hypotheses. So the objective here was to determine if beetle, co beetle colonization of trees uh, in tree trunks uh, is associated with lightning damage in a lowland tropical forest of Panama. So our primary hypothesis here was that uh, beetle damage here quantified as abundance of beetle entry and emergence holes would be greater in trees uh, in lightning strike sites compared to trees in control sites with no recent history of, of lightning damage. And our secondary hypothesis was that beetle hole abundance, again, what we're using as the quantification of, of beetle damage would be greater in trunk sections of trees in lightning strike sites that are directly below a damaged portion of the crown or the canopy directly above. Um, and we base this hypothesis on data from previous studies in uh, temperate forests, which have indicated that uh, when lightning strikes a tree, typically toward the top, that electrical current is gonna be traveling directly down in pretty much a vertical line down to the ground. So we would expect lightning damage and thus beetle damage uh, to be greater in those trunk sections that are right below a damaged crown section. So then get into the methods here. So the study site, as I said before, all the field work was conducted on uh, Vera, Colorado Island, uh, commonly abbreviated to uh, BCI uh, by the people who are doing research there. Um, the area, just to give you a sense of the size, uh, was a 15.6 square kilometers or six square miles. And on average, uh, we see 12.7 uh, cloud to ground lightning flashes uh, per square kilometer per year on this island. And this is just a map of, uh, of BCI, the sort of official map from the uh, Smithsonian uh, website. Um, you can see the orange dot there in the top right represents the uh, field station where we all stayed at. And then the uh, white lines here represent the different uh, trails. So I did most of my work in this general area right here, not so much in the far outreaches, uh, thankfully for me. Um, but generally most of this work was in this general region. So about 45 minute hike generally on average probably out to a site then 45 minutes back with two or three hours, probably about three hours on average a day quantifying uh, beetle damage in these trees. Um, but I'll get more into that in just a moment. So first what we had to do is we actually had to locate these lightning strike sites. So to do that, we used a system of video surveillance cameras uh, mounted on towers 
uh, throughout the Barrow Colorado Island forest uh, to then locate uh, these lightning strike sites uh, via triangulation. So then, so then once we had the approximate coordinates, we then go to the sites, identify lightning damage in a site, and then quantify lightning damage in each tree in a given site. So overall, we, we surveyed 10 lightning strike sites. And for each of those sites, we paired it with a control site based on having a central tree in that control site that was of the same species and of a similar diameter to the struck tree in the paired strike site. And the paired, the paired sites strike and control had similar diameter distributions overall. And that's just a photo of a, a cloud to ground lightning flash that was taken on uh, June 1st, 2019, just to give you a sense of what that looks like. So these are very advanced cameras that Dr. Gora could tell you about, but they are able to essentially pinpoint exactly when the lightning flashes and then take a photo right there. So it's very cool uh, how you can get a, a photo of that. Um, but moving on to this next photo, um, this was a photo taken uh, from the ground, looking up at the canopy at one of our larger lightning strike sites. And on the left there, you can see trees that were within the lightning damage radius. So very much lacking in foliage up there versus trees on the right there were outside of the lightning damage radius and have very plentiful foliage. So there's that photo. And then this next photo is the same lightning strike site, except this was taken with an aerial drone. And you can see again, these trees that are within the strike damage radius, uh, very much lacking in foliage uh, versus the trees outside of this radius have very plentiful foliage. And if you look closely there down on the ground, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow pointer, but right around there, that was the landing pad for our drone, just for you drone enthusiasts. Um, and over here, if you see there's a red dot and a gray dot right there. That is Dr. Gore and that is me right there in the gray shirt. So you can barely see us, but we're down there. So that is the same site, but taken from above with that drone. So very cool that we were able to get this uh, photo. And moving into the beetle damage uh, survey. So this is where I really came in. So beetle damage was surveyed uh, by me uh, between June and uh, 2019, June and uh, July of 2019. And what this consisted of was me going to each tree in the, in the strike and control sites and uh, dividing the trunk into eight sections uh, based on the cardinal directions. So north, northeast, east, et cetera. Then in each of these eight trunk sections, I would count beetle holes between 0 0.8 and 1.8 meters off the ground for each tree. And also for each uh, tree, we recorded distance of that tree from the central tree in the sites in meters, uh, the percent crown dieback of that tree, a uh, measurement of the, the extent to which the crown uh, defoliated uh, since we began the surveys, and uh, tree size and DBH, and in the trees in the lightning strike sites, uh, we recorded either the presence or the absence of a damaged portion of the crown uh, above each uh, given trunk section, again, eight around each tree. This is a photo of a close-up of the bark of one of our uh, lightning struck trees, one of our largest ones. Um, for those of you who are viewing it on full screen, that's about the actual size of that click beetle right there. So it was a pretty large one. Um, and the yellow arrows there are just pointing to the most uh, prominent beetle holes on this uh, tree chunk right here in this snapshot. And just in this snapshot, I counted before the presentation, I counted 25 holes in this snapshot alone. And this was just a portion of the, just the area I measured. So you can imagine on um, the entire tree, just how many beetle holes were, were there. So easily within the hundreds. And getting into the statistical analyses. And uh, I will be honest, Dr. Gora did the most of this and he really helped me out in teaching me uh, how to do this. But so I got some sort of introductory uh, experience with R in doing this. But just to say this really quickly, um, we used a generalized linear mixed effects model with uh, Poisson errors uh, to determine if uh, beetle hole abundance uh, varied uh, based on site. So whether the tree was in a strike or a control site and to determine if beetle hole abundance varied uh, based on tree characteristics. So uh, tree DBH, uh, percent crown dieback, distance from the central tree. And we used another generalized linear mix effects model with Poisson errors to determine if beetle hole abundance varied uh, in trunk sections of trees and lightning strike sites based on if there was healthy crown or lightning damage crown directly above. And we compared models based on uh, AIC values. 
Now getting into our results. So what did we find? Um, so overall, I surveyed 173 trees at the 10 strike sites and 137 trees at the 10 uh, control sites. And overall, we found that there were significantly more beetle holes uh, in trees at the lightning strike sites compared to the control sites. Uh, specifically, there were 370% more beetle holes in strike sites compared to control sites. So pretty significant difference there. Then getting into our figures here, uh, these are each going to represent uh, the relationship between the tree characteristic and beetle hole abundance. So this first one's looking at percent crown dieback. So each of these dots here represents a tree and the black dots represent the uh, trees in the strike sites. The clear or white dots represent trees in the control sites. So with increasing percent crown dieback, we saw an increase in beetle hole abundance in strike sites, but not at control sites. There was no relationship between crown dieback and beetle hole abundance at control sites. As you can see, they're very, very much scattered around here. Then we get to DBH, so tree size. We found again that at the strike sites, uh, with increasing tree DBH, increasing tree size, we found uh, an increase in the number of beetle holes, uh, similar to the crown dieback relationship. Um, however, we did not find a relationship between tree DBH and beetle hole abundance at the control sites. And finally, getting to the distance from the central tree. So this was an interesting result that we found. Um, at the strike sites, we did not find any relationship between distance from the central tree and a beetle hole abundance, which goes against what you might expect. You would expect that closer to the strike, you would have more beetle or lightning damage and that's more beetle damage in the tree, but this isn't what we found. Um, versus at the control sites, we found that uh, as distance from the central tree increased, uh, beetle hole abundance also uh, decreased. So as you move farther away from that central tree in the control site, uh, beetle hole abundance was found to decrease. And I'll get into a possible explanation for why that may have been in just a bit. And then finally getting to our trunk section relationship here. So we found that trunk sections of holes or trunk sections of trees in uh, uh, lightning damage sites has significantly more uh, beetle holes when there was a lightning damage portion of the crown directly above compared to trunk sections that had healthy crown directly above. So that supported our hypothesis, our second hypothesis there. Then get, getting into some preliminary data. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, the specifics of coleoptera and taxonomy, um, I'm, I'm certainly not in the very specific uh, knowledge of that. But uh, for those of you who are, uh, uh, identifying a bunch of beetle specimens down at the species level within a two month span of an RU uh, summer research experience would have been extremely difficult. So we did not uh, incorporate that into uh, this current study, but uh, we did collect some preliminary data using flight intercept traps uh, that is being used as a part of a separate ongoing study in Dr. Unobiak's lab at, uh, at University of Louisville. So just to give you a sense of the tax of that were more uh, dominant at each kind of site, and forgive me if I butcher these pronunciations, but the uh, subfamily Scolitinae and the subfamily of Platypodinae uh, were more dominant at the strike sites, while the family uh, Patillodactylidae and the subfamily of Curculioninae uh, were more dominant at the control sites. And just so that's not complete gibberish, I have some photos here. On the left there, that is an example of a beetle of the subfamily uh, Platypodinae, which were more dominant at the strike sites. And on the right there looks well, looks like a weevil there, but I'm not sure in the exact species there. Uh, that is a member of the subfamily of Curculioninae, which was more dominant at the control sites. And for those of you who know more about uh, coleoptera and taxonomy, who want to let me know more about that, I will be happy to talk with you uh, later. Um, so then we get into our discussion. So our overall conclusions, I'll just state them very clearly. So lightning damage tropical trees were found to have more beetle damage, again, quantified as beetle hole abundance uh, than healthy trees. Um, beetle damage increases with tree size and uh, lightning damage to the crown in these lightning uh, damaged trees in tropical uh, forests. And three, lightning appears to travel directly down the trunk, uh, thus facilitating beetle infestations in these trunk sections that are directly below. Let me get back to this dead wood relationship. So like I said before, lightning is a, is a prominent producer of dead wood and our results definitely suggest that lightning is a reliable source of dead wood for these saproxylic beetle communities 
uh, in tropical forests for generations to come post strike. Um, so there's that. In addition, we also found that in general, light, the trees killed by lightning strikes uh, in, or flashover damage uh, in these tropical forests uh, typically died standing up. And this has an interesting implication for beetle biodiversity in these forests. So if the tree dies standing up, you're not only gonna have dead wood more towards the base of the trunk, you're gonna have dead wood up at the top more towards the canopy level. So we would expect with dead wood at these different levels on the tree, altitudinal levels, you could say, that they're probably going to be supporting different assemblages of beetles at these different levels on the tree, particularly at the canopy level versus more at the base of the trunk level. So we would expect that uh, sproxic beetle biodiversity would be greater uh, in these lightning strike sites compared to other sites um, in, in these tropical forests. In addition, for those of you who are uh, up to date on climate change, um, certain somebody sitting in the White House certainly doesn't, um, but uh, with climate change, uh, our, stu our studies that have been done indicate that uh, as, light, as climate change intensifies, uh, lightning strike frequency is expected to increase. So we'd expect that in years to come, because climate change is only expected to intensify, um, lightning strike frequency, particularly in tropical forests, is going to increase. Uh, in addition, we would then expect the abundance and diversity of dead wood to increase, and in turn, the abundance and diversity of uh, saproxic beetles to increase, which again, like I was mentioning at the start, is are probably going to have cascading effects on other taxonomic groups in tropical forests, uh, particularly those who uh, utilize dead wood, like these saproxic beetles. And then getting into probably the most complex relationship to dissect here was that beetle damage and distance from the central tree uh, relationship. So in our strike sites, what we hypothesize is a, is a probable reason as to why we didn't find a relationship between distance from the central tree and beetle hole abundance was that uh, apart from the trees that are directly struck and killed by these lightning strikes, the trees that just receive this flashover damage um, whether it be major damage, major flashover uh, electrical currents or, or just minor damage, um, it's likely or at least possible that their defensive capacities are being weakened to about the same extent. So if their defensive capacities are being weakened to the same extent, pretty much overall, apart from the trees that are directly struck and killed, we would expect there to be really no relationship between distance. We would expect beetle colonization to be about equal in all these lightning damaged trees, not struck trees within these strike sites. Um, the possible explanation for the relationship between distance from the central tree and beetle hole abundance in the control sites is a bit trickier. So if you, if you take into account that the trees that are most likely to be struck by lightning are these oldest, uh, tallest trees in a given stand, so in our strike sites, and if you take into account how we paired our central trees in our control sites, with these struck trees in our lightning strike sites, you would then expect uh, these central trees in the control sites to be the uh, tallest, oldest trees uh, in that control site. So you could expect, most likely, as you move farther away from this central tree in the control site, you're going to be getting smaller and small, smaller trees as you get farther away, at least in that given stand of trees. So you would expect then with less colonizable area for these beetles, as you get farther and farther away from this largest tree in the site, you, it would then make sense that beetle hole abundance decreases uh, with, with uh, increasing distance from that central tree. So it's a possible reason why we, why we got this result here. And then finally, some questions for the future. So one, is lightning damage more attractive to beetles than other common types of damage in forests? For example, in a future study, if you compared uh, beetle hole abundance in trees that were killed by a lightning strike, would you find that it's greater than trees that were felled by strong winds from a hurricane? We don't know this yet, um, particularly in tropical forests. Um, two, does lightning damage lead to contagious infestations in undamaged neighboring trees? So we didn't actually look at beetle hole abundance on these trees just outside of our lightning strike sites. And what we may have found is that beetle hole abundance will be greater in these trees just outside of our lightning strike sites, still outside the strike radius though, um, compared to trees uh, farther away from that lightning strike site. So that's another option for future research. And finally, this is probably the most interesting to me. Um, 
Is it more that lighting damage is compromising tree defenses against these beetles in tropical forests, or and it's not mutually exclusive, or is it more that uh, trees that are struck by lightning are damaged by flashover? Are they producing unique chemical signatures that are attractive to certain beetle species? Um, and this has been looked at to a certain extent in temperate forests, but not tropical forests. So these are all very valid avenues for future research. And that's it. I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Let me just get out of the screen share here. Thank you, Brady. That was a great talk. Does anyone have any questions for him? I just, I just feel free to unmute yourself and speak up for questions. I have a quick question. That seemed like an awful high lightning strike. What's normal in a temperate zone like around here? High in terms of the frequency? Yes. You know, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know. I just, I really was looking into the frequency in tropical forests. Um, there's a myriad of studies, especially in pine forests um, in, in our area, actually, in our area, more in the southeastern United States. Um, I'm not sure on the average. Um, that's, that's just I, what I know from BCI. I have a quick question. I um, have never tried to identify a tree after it's been struck by lightning, but did you all look into the species of trees that you used, especially in the control sites when you were like creating those sites specifically? So on my end, what I dealt with was not so much uh, the, the species. Uh, Dr. Gore and Dr. Inovia, I could speak to that uh, probably more. Um, I know that Bombacopsis was, was one that was, was common, um, I think in control sites. Uh, but as far as which ones were more dominant, I'm not sure on that. We look, what I was focusing in on here was the, uh, the beetle subfamilies and families, um, but that's definitely uh, a possible relationship we could look into in the future to see if there are specific tree species of uh, beetle species relationships with this phenomenon. Thank you. Any other questions for Brady? All right, then. Well, thank you again, Brady. So no go, ahead. go ahead, going ahead and moving on to our next speaker. Um, Emily Jones is another graduate student here. Uh, she's in her second year in Dr. Braccia's lab and is studying emergence in some headwater valleys. So take it away, Emily. Thank you. Emily, Emily Pat Calder, could, could I record your presentation, Emily? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, so I'm very excited to talk with you guys about this today. And the research that I did over the summer I'm using uh, for today's talk is insect emergence from two headwater valleys in eastern Kentucky, which is a part of my thesis. So insect emergence is a very important life cycle event in aquatic insects. So as we can see in this image, stages one through three are aquatic. They spend the first half of their life growing and developing in water. Once they reach a certain size, they become ready to emerge and are then sexually mature reproduce, pass on their genes to the next generation, and then their life cycle is over, so they die. Without that important emergence stage, all of the energy that they acquired during their growth and development would be retained within the aquatic system. So in this image, we have two distinct food webs, one the aquatic and the other terrestrial. In the aquatic food web, the base is made up of algae and detritus, such as leaves or coarse woody debris that fall into the system. This is then eaten by the stream insects. And as they grow and develop, they're predated on by organisms such as fish. And that's a closed loop. That's all that is until 
they're ready to emerge. And with emergence, they bring all of those nutrients and energy out of the aquatic system and into the terrestrial environment, specifically as food for larger, or excuse me, higher taxa such as bats and birds. As a quick little divergence, I want to talk about how humans alter aquatic landscapes, specifically in Appalachia. So in this image, these three images, we can see historical disturbance that has left notable marks on our landscape. So during the early colonial periods and into the 20th century, there were practices that involved clear cutting entire valleys in Appalachia. And in this top image here, you can actually see this large pile of logs. They would clear cut the valley, pile all them up, and then use dynamite to straighten rivers and float them downstream. The result being empty, fertile valleys available for agriculture. Because there's no longer any trees on the hillside, a lot of erosion took place and there was a buildup of sediment in these valleys that we call legacy sediments. These valleys often had streams running through the middle of them and in order to get rid of that to access the most fertile land, farmers would channelize and reroute the stream along the edge of the hillside. And that's the landscape that we see to this day. Historically, they look like something on the left. So this is an artistic rendition of a pre-European Appalachian Valley. These valleys were often slow moving and meandering with multiple branches in their channels. And there was a lot of connectivity between the surface water and the floodplains. On the right, we can see an aerial image of a restored valley with the arrows pointing to beaver ponds. And we can see examples of this and a branching, these multiple branching throughout the channels. So this system functions as it historically would have pre-European disturbance. That was actually a aerial image of the restored valley that is a part of my thesis. So when I think of this valley, I think of characteristics such as beaver ponds, like you saw imaged before. Uh, there are now, as of March, seven dams in this valley um, for a total of seven beaver ponds. As we can see in this image here on the right, both of these actually, they have really low channel banks. And so anytime there is a storm event, rather than the water rushing down the channel really fast, it's able to rise above the banks and disperse across the floodplain. And this is important for kind of releasing the energy rather than focused in one tight area, but all across the valley floor. And all three of these photos, we can see examples of coarse woody debris within the stream itself, which is very important for stream insects because it provides a food source and shelter from predators. And we know through different experiments that there is high connectivity between the surface water and the groundwater, which allows this entire valley to stay inundated throughout the entire year. This is an aerial image taken off of Google so we can see how meandering it is. In addition to these floodplain depressions, which are small pools located off of the main branch that only have water connected to them during high periods of rain. When we compare that to an unrestored valley, one that's been historically impacted through channelization or dredging, um, we think of it as being very straight. So in these bottom two images, this line right here is actually the stream channel. So you can notice it's right up against the edge. It's not in the middle at all, and it's very straight. And then we can see in this image here, standing in one spot, you can see straight down the channel for quite a ways. These three images were actually taken in May. The very next month, um, June, up until this most recent month I was out there, which was September, it's been completely dry. There's been no water in this channel at all, which implies that there's not a lot of connectivity between the surface water and the groundwater here. Despite having a pretty dense canopy, there is little to no woody debris or detritus of any type within the system. I'm going to put my foot in my mouth right here because here is some detritus. But this is what we call a leaf pack. So as a material fall into the water, they get hung up on exposed roots or large rocks. But these are often washed away with any type of rain event because this creek is so flashy, again, due to the channelization and not being able to disperse across the floodplain. 
There's a lot of erosion going on here, as you can tell by these exposed roots and these incised channel banks. This is where the water just cuts away at the bedrock because it can't go anywhere except for downstream. We would expect insects to respond to these two distinct hydrologic functions differently. So here we have a predictive image where on the left is a very heterogeneous landscape. It is resemblant of my restored valley. It's very meandering, there's branches, there are floodplain depressions nestled within it. And then on the right, we have a very homogenized system, one that's been channelized and impacted by humans for purposes such as agriculture. So these peaks are representative of emergent events from insects. So the further left or the more blue, the earlier in the year they occur, the further in the right or more red, the later in the year. So in the heterogeneous landscape, we see a heterogeneous response from the insects with continuous peaks of emergence occurring throughout the year. Whereas on the right, we have a very homogenized response with only maybe one or two peaks occurring throughout the year. This is partly in due to who can survive at these two sites. So this is a very homogenized system. Maybe only one or two groups of taxa can tolerate these conditions, whereas here we have a range of conditions suitable for a wide diversity of aquatic insects. And that's all that my thesis is. I'm comparing emergence between the aquatic habitats of these two headwater valleys that have different habitat complexity and functions, uh, hydrologic functions, as a result of human activities. In order to test this, my study design involved creating these one week sampling periods where I would go out and place emergence traps over dominant habitats at each location. So here we can see an image of my emergence traps. Between the two valleys, my restored and unrestored, I sampled three different locations. So in my restored valley, I sampled both the channel as you see pictured here and a beaver pond. And then at the unrestored site, I only had the channel to sample. After this one week period, insects were identified to morphospecies, counted, and then measured for biomass. And those are the results that I want to talk about today. So the next series of graphs are all set up in the same manner, where we have the month the sampling occurred along the x axis. The y axis is going to be the mean plus or minus the standard error of either abundance in individuals per meter squared or biomass in milligrams per meter squared. And all of these graphs are scaled to per day. So all I did was take the number of days that the traps were deployed and then divided my total to get these graphs. So the first thing I want to point out here is this consistent decreasing trend across abundance from my restored site, which is consistent with literature that says the peak emergence for our temperate area should be in mid to late spring. Since May was right at the end of spring, June, July, and August are into summer, this decreasing trend is consistent. I also want to point out the difference between the two sites. So this number here is the number of traps I had at each location. Again, this one is higher because I had two aquatic habitats, but even with that, we can see what appears to be a significant difference in the number of individuals emerging between each of these valleys. This is the same, except looking at biomass. So there's a lot of funky stuff going on here with May. So I'm gonna go back real quick so you can pay attention to the abundance here. So here's the abundance and then here's the biomass. This is important because it tells us a lot about who is emerging during this time period. And although I don't have the data ready to present, during May, there were a lot of large bodied Plecoptera stoneflies emerging from the unrestored site during this time that were not emerging from the restored site during this time. And I believe that's what's driving this trend in biomass. However, during June, July, and August, we can see again the same trend where the restored site appears to have significantly more biomass emerging per day than the unrestored site. Next, I wanna break it down by looking at location. So 
The Beaver Pond and Slab Camp are both my restored valley locations, and then Jones Branch is my unrestored location. The abundances in May, there seems to be no difference between the Beaver Pond and the restored stream, but both appear to have a higher abundance than the unrestored stream. And then in June, July, and August, we see this really important trend of the beaver pond appearing to have significantly more abundance than the other two streams. This is important because even if Jones Branch was, the unrestored valley was appearing to be consistently equal to the emergence occurring at the restored stream, it would not have this beaver pond habitat to add to the productivity of the valley. Biomass is similar, where we see this almost no difference in May. Again, I believe it's just driven by the plecopteran that we're emerging. And then in June, July, and August, the beaver pond outperforms both channels, but the channel at the restored site slab camp still does significantly, appears to do significantly more than the unrestored site. This next two graphs are messy, but they're important. So if anyone has any on ideas on how to represent this in a better fashion, please let me know. So within each of the three locations, Beaver, Slab Camp, and Jones Branch, I measured dominant habitats. So in the beaver ponds, these were deep open habitats, shallow open habitats, and shallow vegetated habitats. At Slab Camp and Jones Branch, these were pools, riffles, and runs within the channel. Um, so starting with the beaver pond, in June to July, there was a drying event that caused the beaver pond to shrink significantly, and I lost all of the emergent vegetation. And then when it refilled, it had already passed the growing season for those plants, and so they never came back. So in July and August, I only have open habitat, both deep and shallow sampled. Because their replicates are only four, it's really difficult to discern any trends here, but I do think it's important that during the peak of the summer, July and August, the shallow seems to overtake the deep habitats and the number of individuals emerging per day. At slab camp in May, the riffles, for some reason, almost have nothing emerging from them, whereas the slower portions, the pools and the runs, have much higher emergence. And then June, July, and August, there's no difference between the three habitats. At Jones Branch, like I mentioned in the earlier slide, it dried after May, and so I no longer had aquatic habitat to sample. Instead, I lumped everything into a dry category. There has been research showing that aquatic insects can emerge from moist soils. So if this was occurring, I wanted to capture that event. And you can see in July and August, I did get some. In June, I got practically nothing. In biomass, again, these are similar trends where I would like to point out in July and August, the importance of the shallow open habitats in the beaver pond, that the riffles in May attributed almost nothing to the totals. And then again, in summer, Jones Branch attributing almost nothing, most likely due to the dry stream bed. So in summary, there was a higher abundance of emerging insects during all months at the restored valley. And there was a higher biomass during all months except for May at the restored valley. This trend seems to be driven by the beaver ponds because they were the most important for magnitude. So this is abundance and biomass lumped together in June through August. Jones Branch, the unrestored valley dried after May, leaving little to no time for aquatic insect emergence for certain groups during the summer months. And going forward, data collection will continue into the spring of 2021. I also plan to do analysis of diversity. This will include looking at richness and the phenology of the three sampling locations, the restored channel, the beaver pond, and the unrestored channel. I do know that I have already collected a mayfly emergence event at the end of June, or excuse me, end of July, which is super exciting. That was not present in the unrestored channel or the beaver pond. It was specific to the restored site. So I'm very excited to look at that. And then I'll also compare the three sampling locations using a diversity indice. 
And then finally, please no one hold me to this, but I'm writing it down, so hopefully it'll happen, a thesis defense in March or April of next year with all of my combined data. I'd like to acknowledge the University of Louisville Stream Institute for all of their help on this project, US EPA Region 4, Northern Kentucky Fly Fishers for funding, Eastern Kentucky University Biology Department for all of their work, and the many, many undergraduate and graduate students from EKU that I had help do this field work. It was quite a bit. And with that, I would like to take any questions. Thank you, Emily. Uh, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to speak up. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I know you said you didn't have the data ready to present, um, but are you? Do you have any interesting trends popping up among um, insect diversity? Boy, do I ever! So, um, one of the things that I have found particularly fascinating with this. Um, I did mention capturing that mayfly emergence event out of the restored stream that was not present um, at my other two sampling locations, but the unrestored site appears to have more brachycerin flies emerging than my restored valley, which I don't really know what it means yet, but it's an interesting trend. And then in addition to that, just looking at the um, number of morpho species that I've identified, most of them appear to be coming out of the beaver pond. Um, I do have groups that are not, so the majority of my diversity, I should back up, is nematocerin flies. The majority of those come out of my beaver ponds. Um, but I do have a higher diversity of mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies coming out of my restored site than my unrestored site. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions? All right, I suppose not. Thank you again, Emily, for the great talk. Um,